All right, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, to our readings tonight from the AML Award finalists. The AML Awards will be presented this uh, Saturday evening, and we have the finalists tonight in creative nonfiction, religious nonfiction, and criticism to read to us. And I'll turn the time over to Andrew Hall to introduce them and conduct tonight. Thanks, Andrew. Great, thank you. Um, my backpack on the kitchen. So let me talk a second about what, out of the way, what these um, different categories are. So we, there's lots of nonfiction. It's hard to figure out exactly how to, to divide it up somehow and how to recognize different things. In the last few years, we've had a system where we have basically three areas and books can kind of, you know, there's, there's arguments. We have different judges every year. Uh, I'm not one of the judges. Uh, we have we have different judges every year, and they have to kind of discuss. Well, does this book belong in this category? In this category, so creative nonfiction, religious nonfiction, and criticism. So, creative nonfiction we generally see as personal essays and memoirs. So, nonfiction that's of a more personal type, uh, maybe a, a more literary type, uh, not so much trying to teach something as to kind of express uh, personal experiences. Then religious nonfiction is nonfiction that is uh, more about religious issues specifically. So that can certainly include personal things, but is perhaps more on the education side of things with that. And that includes um, books about the scriptures, any kind of scriptural analysis like, uh, like Fatima and Margaret's book and Michael's book this, this year. Um, also books that are, uh, you know, kind of social studies, so social, social science studies of the church, um, any kind of academic books that are not history because the Mormon History Association does a great job honoring history books. And so we leave history books to them, uh, except for this year, we do have two books that are very, very much history. And there was a lot of back and forth amongst the judges about that this year, that William Davis's book, uh, Visions in the Seer Stone and Taylor Petrie's book, Tabernacles of Clay, which are definitely history books but the judges wanted to include them because uh, Visions in the Seer Stone has a lot of uh, scriptural analysis and, and, and talking about the, the content of the Book of Mormon in it. So besides just the, the history of what was going on with Joseph Smith. And Taylor's book so much spoke, spoke about the history of sexuality and gender in Mormonism, but also a lot about what's going on today, issues today. And we kind of see things that are issues today under our purview. And Levina Fielding Anderson's um, uh, a collection of kind of personal books, uh, personal essays about her, about the LDS religion and her experiences in the LDS religion. So that could have gone back and forth between creative and religious, but let's put it religious. And then uh, criticism are nonfiction books and articles. The other, the other two ones are just books, but criticism we include articles as well um, that are about art, uh, literature or art. They're writing about, so specifically criticism but also kind of history of art and, and other kinds of, of attempts to try to, to understand specific, specifically LDS made art. Hey, and it started with just literature. Micah? Oh, that sounds Fatima is coming in. Uh, we started out talking about literature, I think when this category was first created, when the AML, AML Awards first started in 1978, but we've broadened it to include music and, uh, and, and uh, physical art. Um, visual art. Okay, so that is three categories. We also have two special awards this year, a special award in nonfiction for This is the Plate, uh, Utah Food Traditions, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. We have the editors, two of the editors here for that. And also a special award in religious nonfiction for the Book of Mormon Brief Theological Introductions, a wonderful series from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. Uh, we don't have any readings from that today, but, but we'll be um, honoring that at the award ceremony as well. Okay, so here's the order we're going to go in, in. Now, sounds like Fatima is here now. Fatima, did, I have you going first, but you just arrived. Are you okay to go to do your yeah, reading now? Great. I am. Lovely. Let me uh, give a brief introduction. Okay. And I'm sorry. I'm gonna blood up. Okay. And so Margaret is not here, right? But, but Fatima is? No. Okay. So this is a co-authored co, co book, Fatima Sal Sala. <laughs> Saleh? I don't know. I was told. Is that okay? I'm sorry. Saleh, yes. <laughs> Saleh, great. 
And Margaret Olson Hemming um, co-wrote, uh, Fatima was born in Brooklyn, New York. At 15, she joined the Elias Church and later served a mission in Campinas, Brazil, and has taught Elias Institute. She received her PhD in mass communication from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she's the founder of A Certain Work, an organization dedicated to educating on issues of faith, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And her co-author, Margaret Olson Hemming, is the editor-in-chief of Exponent 2, a quarterly magazine produced by Mormon feminists that has been publishing since 1974. She sits on the board of the Center for Latter-day Saint Art and has a deep love for Mormons, Mormon women's art. And their book is called The Book of Mormon for the Least of These, Volume One. So Fatima, go ahead. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm on the East Coast, so it's 10 o'clock here. Um, I'm grateful to be here doing the reading on behalf of both Margaret and myself. I'm gonna start at the introduction. I think that's the best place to start for our book. And the fact that it's a commentary about the Book of Mormon and reading it from the lens of social justice. Introduction. The strength and beauty of a holy text is that it can be read again and again with different and new understandings and insights revealed every time. A holy test text is not exhausted by a single interpretation. It compels readers to return and review, re-examine and reinterpret. The Bible has withstood a millennia of innumerable methods of understanding, orthodox, liberal, academic, literary, feminist, etc. The Book of Mormon has certainly experienced readers examining it from various points of view, including through history, literature, and orthodoxy. But a close reading of the complete book as scripture that has messages about oppression, inequality, and other issues of social justice has not been available until now. This book, the first in a trilogy, is a social justice exegesis of the first third of the Book of Mormon, from first Nephi to the words of Mormon. All forms of exegesis or the critical interpretation of the holy text use some kind of personal interpretation, even if the, that personal lens goes unrecognized or unacknowledged. Unlike some other scriptural commentary, we don't pretend to be lacking bias. We wrote this book intentionally looking for messages about issues related to social justice. As we worked in this book, we specifically asked the questions, who is present but unheard? Who is suffering and why? What kind of violence is in the background of this story? How does this call to us to relieve affliction? How are, there, how are these actions informed by trauma? What are the diverse ways that God is showing up in this person's life? What are the assumptions this person is making? Is there another way to understand this story? We would never claim that this is a definitive way of reading this text, simply that is one that has been vastly underutilized in mainstream Mormonism. I'm gonna skip a little bit and move to a couple of paragraphs. A few words about this, about how this book should be read. Scriptural commentary should not be consumed all at once. We assume that the reader is immediately familiar with the text we're examining. So we recommend reading the re reference verses in the Book of Mormon first, then reading the commentary. This book should enhance your study of the Book of Mormon. So reading small sections, then sitting and pondering the concepts presented will yield the best results. While we, while we believe that all readers, including those new to the Book of Mormon, will enjoy the book, those who are familiar with the LDS scripture will likely understand our thesis more clearly. Additionally, we have chosen to leave out portions of 2 Nephi that are quotations from Isaiah because several social justice examinations of that text already exist. I'm just moving to the last paragraph. Actually, the paragraph before. Throughout the book, we use terms that reflect a certain kind of engagement with the divine. We frequently refer to, the, to a wrestle, referencing the hard and inelegant struggle to understand God or scripture. As we work together, we have repeatedly said out loud, God shows up in the mess. By which we mean 
that mortal life is complicated, humans make terrible mistakes, and we're all deeply inadequate, but God is there for us anyway. God's grace covers us over and over again and again, even though we don't deserve it. The Book of Mormon prophets do not shield readers from their own vulnerability. It is common for them to introduce themselves, giving their, giving their name and family background before sharing their story. Many of them apologize in advance for their own mistakes in their accounts. The writers frequently do not skirt around times they have sinned, failed, or doubted. This is a particularly human and personal book of scripture. One of the greatest gifts the Book of Mormon can give us is the understanding that even prophets are fallible humans and that a journey with God does not require flawlessness to, a to be beautiful and valuable. This liberates us to know that we can repeatedly fail and still be called to do God's work. As you read this book, we hope that you will see how the Book of Mormon calls us all to toward lives of justice work, that you will offer the people in the book and in your lives more compassion, and that you will ponder the ways in which you can liberate the oppressed. If this book helps at all in your efforts to understand your journey with God, it would have fulfilled its purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Padma. That was great. Next, we'll turn to Michael Austin, who will be reading from his book, Buried Treasures, reading the Book of Mormon again for the first time. Michael is Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at the University of Evansville. He is the author of 10 previous books, including Rereading Job, Understanding the, the, the Ancient World's Greatest Poem, which won the AML Religious Nonfiction Award in 2014. He also won a Criticism, criticism Award for his essay, How to Be a Mormo american in 1995. His monograph on the works of Vardis Fisher will be published by the University of Illinois Press this year. And he's the editor, he is an editor at P P BCC Press and chairman of the board of Dialogue. Michael, go ahead. And, and unmute yourself first. Okay, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? So um, the book Buried Treasures was, is a collection of blog posts uh, that came out in 2016. In 2016, I decided to read the Book of Mormon for the first time in 30 years. I had not read it. And I, as I explained in the introduction, I, I was afraid to read it because uh, I was afraid that, that I wouldn't like it and that I would find it um, not up to standards, which I didn't actually find. Um, I actually had a really wonderful experience with it. I blogged about it. Uh, I collected these blog posts into 44 short essays, which is what this book is. And then actually this is kind of a transitional work. Uh, I've taken about 10 of these essays that are about type scenes shared between the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And those have become the foundation for the book I'm currently working on, which is called How the Book of Mormon Reads and Rereads the Bible, uh, which is um, uh, will be out sometime before I die, we hope. So I am just gonna read one chapter here. This is chapter 14. It covers the books of Jerem and Omni, and uh, uh, it's just a little taste of the book. Yeah. Chapter 14, uh, Sneaking Out in the Middle of the Night is the title of the essay. First time that our family read the Book of Mormon, we used the four volume children's version by Dita Peterson Neely. After completing the second volume, I asked my 10 year old son, he's now my 23 year old son, uh, what he thought of it. Well, he said, I'm not sure what it means, but there sure are a lot of people sneaking out in the middle of the night. So I thought about this, I realized that he was right. In the part of the book I identified as the plates of Nephi, three different groups of people are instructed by the Lord to sneak out of the place they are currently living in and head into the wilderness. The whole Book of Mormon begins with Lehi receiving the instruction to leave Jerusalem. Years later, as Laman and Lemuel are plotting to take his life, Nephi is told to do pretty much the same thing. And finally, in the last book on the small plates, we are told that Messiah was warned of the Lord that he should flee out of the land of Nephi, and as many as would hearken unto the voice of the Lord should also depart with him into the wilderness. 
These three stories constitute a type scene or a similar story told at different points in the narrative in ways that invite readers to compare them with each other. The sneaking out in the middle of the night type scene ties together the various narratives featured on the small plates of Nephi, but it also joins the story of the Nephites typologically to the story of the Israelites in the Old Testament, who are also directed by God to flee from Egypt and journey to the Promised Land. A number of articles on the Book of Mormon as literature has, have emphasized the importance of the Exodus type in the framing of the Book of Mormon narrative. It is an important connection, but we need not be careful not to overread the similarities. The differences are important too. In several key ways, the Book of Mormon revises and softens the archetypal story of a people directed by the Lord to escape from their enemies. In the first place, the children of Israel did not sneak out in the middle of the night. Their escape required spectacular intervention by God, miracles, plagues, the death of first sons, the parting of seas, the drowning of armies. The Book of Mormon has very different optics. In all three of the Exodus type scenes, God whispers to a prophet that the people need to leave their homes and depart into the wilderness. And the people leave their home and depart into the wilderness with a minimum amount of drama. The more important difference, however, comes at the end of the journey. In the Bible, the promised land has to be emptied of its current inhabitants before the Israelites can inherit it. This leads to some of the most disturbing chapters in the Bible. In the books of Joshua and Judges, as the Israelites conquer the land of Canaan and massacre its inhabitants. In the Book of Mormon, the promised land is already empty. The people get there and set up a colony without committing a single act of genocide. They do not encounter anybody for some time, and when the Nephites finally do come upon an inhabited city, after sneaking out in the middle of the night, the inhabitants welcome them as cultural saviors and happily turn the government over to their king. Nobody has to die for anybody else's covenant with God. When compared to the Bible then, the Book of Mormon gives us a kinder, gentler exodus with no fighting and no dying on either side of the divide. However, when we place these parts of the Book of Mormon into their 19th century context, they become much more problematic as they replicate the false but common view of the time of America as an empty continent waiting for white people to colonize it. Over and over, contemporary American texts describe the American continent as uninhabited and the 19th century America treated precisely as such. We bought a huge section from France, negotiated with England for another parcel, and we won most, and I have quotes around all of these, most of the rest of it from Mexico, all without concern for the population that had been there for centuries. The population was considered an inconvenience to be removed, and the removal in many ways was as brutal as the conquest of Canaan. But in the collective imagination of the American people, the land was empty and the American Indians were the intruders. The white settlers were likened to the Nephites, colonizing an empty land. Not long after the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, the Latter-day Saints would become a big part of that colonization, beginning with their dramatic exodus from Nauvoo. Like most Americans, the Mormons conceived of the West as substantially empty, but they also believed that the native peoples who were there, who their, uh, who were the descendants of the Lehites in the Book of Mormon, and therefore a people to whom they had a moral and religious responsibility. The Book of Mormon gave settlers a perfect analog for their situation. Like Messiah and the Nephites coming upon the city of Zarahemla, the Mormons imagined themselves to be the cultural saviors of their Lamanite brethren, restoring their history and their sacred books and expecting in return to be made their kings. It didn't always work out so well in practice. The Mormons did at least acknowledge the essential humanity of the Native Americans in a way that many American settlers did not. This softening of the colonial imperative can perhaps be traced back to the patterns of population displacement in the Book of Mormon. The Exodus type in the Book of Mormon is a very real thing, but the typology is as much corrective as it is connective. The Hebrew narratives from the Exodus through the conquest contain some of the most horrifying and indefensible passages in the standard works. And the bulk of the horror comes from God's decision to lead his people to safety in a land that is already inhabited. In the Book of Mormon, the same God does pretty much the same thing over and over again without anybody having to massacre anybody else, which all practical limitations aside strikes me as a much better way to set the people free. Thank you. That was great, thank you very much. Okay, so next we're going to go to Taylor. Uh, Taylor Petries uh, is an associate professor of religion at Kalamazoo College. He's the author of Resurrecting Parts, Early Christians on Desire, Reproduction, and Sexual Difference. 
and co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Mormonism and Gender. He received his doctorate from the Harvard Divinity School, and he's the editor of Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought. Taylor, go ahead. Thank you, Andrew, and it's an honor to be included with this group. I'm gonna read a little bit from the conclusion here. This book has explored one example of a set of teachings that are widely believed to, to be quite stable in Mormonism, but have actually been open to dramatic changes. Latter-day Saint teachings about marriage, gender roles, sexual difference, and sexuality have undergone remarkable transformation since World War II. The teachings and practices of the LDS Church in the early 21st century would already be unrecognizable to Mormon leaders in the mid-20th century. On marriage, Mormons once opposed interracial marriage as a weakening of divinely designed racial boundaries that would transmit a curse to the offspring of any individual of African descent. Too much mixing, socially and reproductively, was a special threat to whiteness and hence to the Mormon priesthood. Church leaders also discouraged marriage between any of the races, with special concern about the budding relationships from white integration with Native Americans and Pacific Islanders. Racial difference was hierarchical difference, and Latter-day Saint leaders treated the mythology of race and lineage as essential to Mormonism's self-understanding, tracing back to its 19th century worldview and heritage. They gradually downgraded this from official doctrine to advice before eventually repudiating the worst expressions of this teaching. Similarly, Mormon leaders once strongly emphasized that, patriarchal or, that the patriarchal order of marriage was an unchangeable divine decree, warning against grave dangers to individuals and society if it were not followed. This established the father as the head of the home, responsible for making decisions, providing financially, and teaching his family. The mother was responsible for bearing children and attending to the duties of the household. Gradually, these teachings gave way to more egalitarian forms of marriage. This soft egalitarianism reconsidered women's duties to bear numerous children and to avoid paid labor, instead encouraging education and personal fulfillment as acceptable values. It also encouraged men to participate more in childcare and household responsibilities. While the older forms of racial and patriarchal hierarchy continue to haunt contemporary Mormonism, their dominance was fractured and replaced. Teachings on marriage, sexual practices within marriage, and gender roles all trended toward greater liberalization during the period of modern Mormonism, even if they lagged behind broader cultural changes. But this progress had its trade-offs. Latter-day Saints could accommodate liberalizing trends on race, marriage, and sexual contacts, birth control, and gender roles, in part because their attention focused on homosexuality as a particularly egregious problem. The construction of a more threatening outsider rendered accommodation to these other changes benign. Church leaders marshaled significant attention and developed new resources for combating homosexuality, a concern that at times both strengthened their resolve for patriarchy and at times enabled its relaxation. But the newness of these efforts must be emphasized in the context of the newness of the category of homosexuality itself. Mormons borrowed this category from the psychological approaches developing in the 20th century. Mingling psychotherapeutic philosophy with Victorian sexual morality, Mormons developed a new subject of censure, but also one deserving of therapeutic care. In this framework, Mormons came to believe that homosexuality was the result of either a deficit of masculinity or femininity, or an overabundance of it. Either way, sexuality was tied to heteronormative, gen heteronormative gender roles. Two new forms of power were developed to confront the concept of homosexuality. Church leaders had long been engaged in sexual purity campaigns and preaching about the household, though these two became more acute in this period. In order to buttress these efforts, the church invested significant capital into psychological treatment and political influence. Complementing their use of counter-psychological frameworks, Latter-day Saint leaders developed new institutions staffed with trained counselors who promised a total cure to the individual who tried hard enough. 
At the same time, LDS leaders pursued a political strategy to socially stigmatize and marginalize gay and lesbian individuals, first by opposing the Equal Rights Amendment and supporting anti-sodomy laws, and later by objecting to same-sex marriage. These efforts were similarly rooted in a theory of gender and sexual instability, without strong social and legal frameworks to enforce sexual difference, gender would become, quote, confused, and a unisex society might result. Some church leaders were so nervous about these outcomes that they believed that within a single generation after destigmatizing same-sex relationships, these sexual practices might be universally adopted. It's a truism in the history of sexuality to say that the concept of heterosexuality can come into existence only jointly with the concept of homosexuality. What allowed Mormons to adapt to these changes was their acceptance of the concept of heterosexuality as the alternative, as the alternative theory of human relations to those of racial difference and patriarchy. Once homosexuality was constructed in Mormon thought in the second half of the 20th century, heterosexual subjectivity also came into existence. But the heterosexual subject was a new kind of category that need not rely on race, though it sometimes did, or on patriarchal hierarchy, though it sometimes did. Instead, heterosexuality as a concept was more able to accept new and different kinds of relationships between men and women than previously allowed. The binary between heterosexual and homosexual delegitimized same-sex relationships, but also created the possibility of new kinds of relationships between men and women that were once considered highly suspect, if not outright forbidden. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, now we're going to talk about the special award uh, in, uh, in nonfiction. This is the plate, Utah Food Traditions. Let me share my screen and let me show you the, um, the award citation. Okay, so this is the plate, Utah Food Traditions, edited by Carol Ed Edison, Eric Eliason, and Lynn S. McNeil. This year, the Associ Association for Mormon Letters is presenting a special award to a book for its cultural contributions that fit none of the existing categories. The book, the first of its kind, is a beautifully produced collection of short ethnographic and socio-historical pieces about Utah's distinctive food heritage with photographs, recipes, and informative rye and woody commentary. This delightful coffee or postum post, 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 post table uh, volume contains entries by over 60 authors on such varied regionally gastronomy relevant top topics as green jello, Hotel Utah hard rolls, and breweries in 19th century Logan. A special note are the contributions by Native American, Latino, and other minority authors who write on their heritage and food ways. And then it goes on and talks about some of the specific, uh, some of the specific ones. So uh, we have two of, the, uh, two of the editors here today who are gonna read some selections, one by video and one live. Carol, we'll start, oh, let me, here, let me introduce the, the editors. So Lynn, sorry, here we go. Uh, Lynn McNeil couldn't be with us today, but Carol A. Edison is retired as director of the Folk Arts Program of the Utah Arts Council. In 1986, she established the Chase Home Museum of Utah Folk Arts, the nation's only museum dedicated to a state collection of contemporary folk art. Edison is a recipient of the American Folklore Society's Benjamin A. Botkin Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Public Folklore. Carol, go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for inviting us to be here. I'm just delighted and um, we can't believe we got this award. Thank you, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sound great. I will, okay, great. Um, tonight I'm gonna read uh, one of my entries, a short one called Dixie Salad. Um, the, the volume uh, is, is broad and it's hard to pick what to go for. So I'll tell you a little bit about Dixie Salad and maybe uh, some of you folks have already tasted it. If you already know what Dixie Salad is, there's a good chance you have some kind of connection to Utah's Washington County. If you haven't heard of it before, it's a sure bet you'll want to try it now. The southwest corner of Utah, known for over 150 years as Dixie, has a different ecosystem than the rest of the state. It is Red Rock Desert Country, home to Zion National Park, and a good part of the county is less than 3,000 feet above sea level and 1,000 feet lower than any other part of the state. 
The area's unique climate allows the production of crops not found in the rest of Utah. In fact, Dixie was originally settled for the express purpose of growing Southern crops like cotton and grapes. It was settled by Mormon converts, some of whom were actually from the American South. They were called to settle this Southern outpost by Brigham Young in order to complement products made in Northern Utah and to help reach the Mormon goal of self-sufficiency. Pecans and pomegranates are two of the low elevation crops still produced in the region today. Warm temperatures, a long growing season, and chalky alkaline soil all contribute to their success. According to Tim Thompson, who operates the county's largest pecan farm, pecan trees were originally brought to Washington County by missionaries who served in the, in the southern states. The origin of the pomegranates is more of a mystery. Known as Utah sweet pomegranates, their willowy bushes are found in backyards throughout the county, and they produce a terracotta colored fruit that is more thin skinned than those from other climes. When local pecans and pomegranates are combined with apples, which also grow well in the county, and grapes or raisins, also historically local products, with just enough whipped cream to thoroughly moisten everything, the result is Dixie salad. For many Washington County residents, Dixie salad is a Thanksgiving fixture, which coincides with harvest time for pomegranates, and a favorite at most every church social school function and community get together. Although many folks say that the recipe was handed down from pioneer times, others attribute it to a salad making demonstration at Dixie Academy in St. George in 1911. Some give the credit to home economics teacher, Mrs. Emily T. Woodward, still others credit of visiting Cook. According to that version of the story, there was to be a demonstration of salad making by an out of town guest they expected to find salad making materials in the local grocery store. None was available at that time of year. From private cellars and storerooms came the ingredients for the first Dixie salad. Today, one can find recipes for Dixie salad both in published cookbooks that feature recipes, quote, tested in Mormon kitchens and in recipe collections on the internet. All recipes have the basics, apples, pecans, grapes, pomegranate seeds, and whipped cream, but many then add fresh canned or dried fruit, as well as miniature marshmallows and maraschino cherries. And without fail, all cooks who share these recipes have roots in this special quarter of Utah. They come from St. George, Hurricane, or New Harmony, Utah, or from nearby Las Vegas or Henderson, Nevada. They sometimes live in Northern Utah, Southern Idaho, or in other places where the sons and daughters of Southern Utah's original pioneers migrated, taking with them a bit of this uniqueness and wonder of Dixie. So that's kind of typical. We have a lot of short essays that uh, delve in various directions about Utah food traditions. Great, thank you so much. Now, Eric Eliasson uh, is also an editor of this volume and he is going to do a, a reading that he sent to me on video. I which I have, and now suddenly I'm only opening the audio. So I'm gonna work on that. I'm gonna, so we're gonna come back to Eric's video and, and show that in a couple minutes. So, but let's go ahead and move on to Patrick Madden, uh, the author of Dis Disparates, I believe is how I pronounce it. Uh, Patrick teaches creative nonfiction at Brigham Young University. So now we're moving all the ones up to now. Well, the first, first three were religious nonfiction. Uh, the next two are going to be creative nonfiction. Uh, and, and Patrick is, is one of our masters of the personal essay. He's the author of two previous collections of essays, Sublime Physique and Quotidien. All your books are hard to pronounce, Patrick. Quotidien. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. You, both of which were honored with AML awards. So just, just give it a hard title. And, and that's yeah, my apologies on the titles. Uh, Disparates works well or disparates in Spanish, which means absurdities or follies, things like that. Okay. Great, um, so I'm going to read an essay from the book called Laughter. I have two essays called Laughter. This is the second one. And uh, it features a scene in church. So I figured it might play well with the audience here. And it also features a short section written by a friend of mine named Jericho Parms. So I have her on audio that I'll, I'll play to accompany me here. Um, I'll go. 
As for insight into character, perhaps there's no better tell than what we laugh at. My wife, Karina, and I can co coincide on large swaths of the humorous, but we lean toward particular ends of the spectrum, which sometimes leads to confused looks and shaken heads. For me, the most visible moments are mostly about puns, the snatches of insight made possible by the imprecisions and overlappings of language. I've had a number of hearty linguistic laughs in my life, but none I think so sublime as the one time I truly and unselfconsciously fell and rolled on the floor laughing. I'll jump ahead so you may miss a little bit, but one day when my parents were visiting us in Ohio, we broke out the game Beyond Balderdash to enliven our e evening. As usual, I was winning not because I knew any of the clues, but because I could often sense and imitate the writing style of the game designer. But when it didn't matter and we were joining the repartee, nobody was sure what had happened on March 26, 1937, but someone suggested that that was when FDR signed social security into law. The movie Take It Big might have featured a British soldier in India who kidnaps an elephant to win the heart of a local beauty. The RCRA, according to the card, really stands for Refrigeration Compressor Rebuilders Association, but I preferred my father's Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, as does allacronyms.com. In any case, my point before getting to my real point is that in a world where even a quark's velocity and position are uncertain, who can know, who can really know such trivia? Then as things were winding up, it was my turn to act as reader. So I collected everybody's definitions for pahoho, a word it turns out that means hardened basaltic lava forming smooth undulations. I hid the scraps of paper inside the box top and arranged them so I could read without giving anything away. But before I could clear my throat, my eyes alighted on my father's mistake. Instead of a definition, he had written an acronymic expansion for the term Pahoho, put a hat on elderly heroes of Europe. I fell sideways out of my chair to the floor, grabbed my gut, juddered uncontrollably. My eyes welled up, my throat blurted out whinnies and whines. I could not get a breath in edgewise. Although they couldn't know what had caused the paroxysm, my family first tentatively, then wholeheartedly joined in the chorus. And we all laughed together for a long while until I composed myself, then explained amidst breakouts of new laughter. Then we laughed again when we all understood the joke of my father's misunderstanding. For hours, it seems now, the smooth undulations of sound rippled, rippled off the walls and reverberated through the apartment out into the street, filling the town with merriment and hope. With the aid of an ultrasound, a baby's heartbeat sounds like, one, a hovering chopper, two, a fast-moving train, three, a snicker or a prayer. Upon first hearing the sound, my body, then only 10 weeks pregnant, erupted into a bout of ungovernable, uncharacteristically high-pitched laughter. A howl so unexpected that my Doppler-wielding midwife couldn't pull the device away in time, capturing and amplifying my laughter into a roar. This startled me into an even harder laugh and nearly rocked me off the table, inspiring my husband to break up and a nearby nurse to chortle at our delight. Holding my breath, I composed myself long enough for the midwife to count 160 heartbeats. BPM, of course, stands for beats per minute, but it could just as easily suggest Beerbaum put it mildly when he wrote that he preferred laughter take him unaware, only so it can master and dissolve me, he said. Who knows what happened on 32637, but on that date, some 80 years later, what had been the source of my greatest crack up, a beat ricocheting in my belly, became a child in flesh, birthed and named, inserting itself, claiming space no one imagined with its own style and cadence. What bold intrusion, what intimate trespass. Shared. Laughter seems the best device dissolving us all, foregoing the status quo for the clumsy interpretations of others, for the pureness of hysteria or unsullied relief, for the allowance of joy. For Karina, on the other hand, slapstick is king. And I've never seen her laugh as hard or as long. She still laughs today whenever she recalls the image even now as she watches this reading. As the time Eduardo Cariello snuck late into church, during the opening hymn, dressed smartly in his suit in preparation to give a talk on some serious point of doctrine. He found an empty spot in the congregation and gingerly, gingerly placed his briefcase on the last folding chair in the row, casting about brief looks of apology and mouthing the words of the hymn. 
Krina and I, sitting and singing a scant distance away, noted with wry smiles the uncomfortable position our Uruguayan friend found him, himself in. And then, just as we intoned the triumphal conclusion to Charles Wesley's Come, let us anew enter into my joy and sit down on my throne. Not really, but that would have been cool. He sat, but not on a chair. With one hand still holding the handle of his bag, he crashed to the floor where there never was a chair. Then tumbled backward, legs splayed, patent leather shoes wagging, neck cricked, and arms waving, jacket flapped open beside his prominent brown pinstriped rump. He righted himself right away, looked around sheepishly, made a show of dusting off, and kept right on mouthing the chorus. Most people seemed not to notice, but Karina left immediately to snicker in the hallway. Then when all efforts to suppress her laugh failed, she stepped outside for a wholehearted guffaw. She repeated this concession to her baser nature every few minutes during the rest of the hour. When it was his turn to speak to us, Brother Cariello smiled and shook his head, apologized for his embarrassing display, then launched into his lesson. Stuck with that image of the poor man sprawled on the floor, heels over head, hind in the air and unable to concentrate on his words, Karina and I missed his message that day. Or perhaps we didn't. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Okay, so I've got the video up ready for um, a second reading for, from This is the Plate, Utah Food Traditions. This is from Eric A. Eliason, who is a professor of English at Brigham Young University and specializes in folklore. His books include The Jay Golden Kimball Stories and Wild Games, Hunting and Fishing Traditions in North America. All right, let's see if I can get this report. The sound. Okay. Uh oh. Is that going to work? Tonight, and thanks to uh, AML for this. Does that work? Can you hear, does everybody hear that? Sure. I'm, I'm, I was hearing it. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry, let me try it again. My computer is saying. What Opportunity. Uh, sorry, you're hearing me as a recording, uh, but uh, by the time you hear this, I will be at Young Men's Camp uh, with the youth of my ward uh, two hours away from any Wi Fi. Uh, what I thought I'd do tonight is read from uh, my chapter and our book, the, uh, This is the Plate, of uh, which I'm one of about 60 contributors. And the chapter I wrote is on scones. And I think I will read this until my time is up. And I'm uh, tracking that here. And uh, at which point I will just stop. And I'm afraid if I've piqued your interest, you'd like to hear more, we'll just have to read the book. Um, To most of the world, scones with jam and clotted cream are an iconic feature of the English tea time meal. They are lightly sweetened, single serving, dry, heavy cakes similar to American biscuits made with various grains, leavened with baking powder and cut into triangles or rounds and baked in especially shaped sheet pans. And I know at this point, many of my audience will be surprised to learn that there is a different kind of stone in the world than the kind we have in Utah. In recent decades, English scones have become sweeter and more likely to contain bits of fruit and chocolate. In Utah, a scone is something quite different. Plain, flat, wheat flour dough, deep or griddle fried to a light, puffy golden brown, in an oil or lard. They more resemble sopapillas, a traditional pastry served with honey and powdered sugar, known for over 300 years by many names and variations throughout the Spanish influenced world. In the American West, such bread is often cooked in larger sizes for a meal, as are sopapillas stuffed with taco and enchilada like filling in New Mexican cuisine. Navajo fry bread with chili on top is an iconic staple among the Diné that has spread to other tribes and gained popularity among non-Native Americans, especially at fairs and powwows. Utah scones are eaten in all of these ways, but can also be shaped and cut 
as sandwich bread, as is done at the only in Utah location of the Scone Cutter Restaurant in Sandy. They highlight their signature items versatility with the motto, everything tastes better on a scone. And they build themselves as home of Utah's homegrown scone. And homegrown it is. As scone refers to this kind of bread only in Utah. David Eddington, BYU linguist and specialist in Utah, Utah regionalism, calls scone the only truly unique Utah word. Recipes can vary somewhat from their Hispanic and native counterparts. Fair vendors who travel the Intermountain West often have separate marquees for Utah and outside Utah. One I met had marquees that said scones or fry bread respectively, depending on where he was. Online recipes for Utah scones and less commonly Mormon scones or elephant ears are more likely to suggest syrup and jams as toppings than sopapilla recipes are and more often contain an egg and buttermilk than fry bread recipes do. Scones are a heritage comfort food with an old timey con connotation often eaten at family gatherings as a special indulgent treat rather than as an everyday food as they might have been in the past with fewer options and less influenced by health food marketing. At least one non-Latter-day Saint online recipe contributor has remarked that preparing and eating scones is a way to settle in as a true Utah. With so much of Utah's predominant culture defined by Mormonism, food items such as scones, thick shakes and fry sauce serve as bridge making non-denominational shared identity markers. And as my time is about up, I will touch briefly on why it is that we in Utah have this term scones and, uh, and what it connection it might have to uh, people in, in England. Um, in the United States, the fact that we speak English leads many people to think that we're a predominantly ethnically English country. English, England as a country of national origin of ancestry or an ethnicity is well down the list, well past German, Italian, um, uh, Irish, H Hispanic, uh, uh, even. It's quite a ways before you get to England. However, in Utah, that's different. And Utah uh, is the most English place uh, in the United States because of the uh, early original converts uh, in, in New England, but also because of convert baptisms in the 19th century in Great Britain, where for many decades in the 19th century, there were more Latter-day Saints in England than there was in, uh, in, um, in Utah, even though they were trying to get there as fast as they could. I'll show you a quick little picture of that as my, my uh, uh, parting thought here. And there you can see counties in the United States and their relative ancestry. And you can see New England with some rural counties still very much English, even though Irish and Italian have uh, predominated in urban areas. Uh, way out, you have to go way out west uh, to Utah to find predominantly English ancestry. And that might be a part of the story as to why um, uh, we call them scones uh, in, in Utah. Um, when they're called up their things uh, elsewhere. Uh, thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, thank you, Eric. And I hope the, the camping trip is going well. Um, all right, so next we're going to move back to uh, creative nonfiction and hear from Malia Day Warner. Uh, Malia loves mothering and writing and tries to merge the two as often as possible. She's an advocate for mothering resources and education particularly in the diagnosis and treatment of postpartum depression. She volunteers with Postpartum Support International Utah and The Emily Effect. Lives of the Magpie, a memoir, is her first published work. Uh, and the manuscript was a 2016 winner of the Utah Arts Council Original Writing Competition. So Malia, don't, go ahead. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, James, Eric, and 
Melissa and everyone hosting this AML conference. Um, I am Malia Warner. I live in American Fork, Utah now with my incredible husband on our five children. And the book Lies of the Magpie is my sixth baby. <laughs> it took me 10 years to write, five years to figure out what I was trying to say, and another five years to figure out how to say it. Lies of the Magpie is my story about becoming a mother and questioning whether being a mother was enough to count my life as successful. So the book is really a journey. Part one is the journey of becoming a mother. Part two is a journey through the black hole of feeling like a failure as a mother, including the dark, yucky, horribly awful abyss of postpartum depression. And then part three is the revelatory journey to discover healing and understanding. And so I thought for tonight that I would share selections from part one and part three. So part one starts with Malia, who's 37 weeks pregnant, driving alone across the Arizona desert toward Tucson when she goes into labor and gets lost. And the chapters go back and forth between the present moment crisis of will she die giving birth alone in the desert and flashbacks to life events that have led her to being where she is here alone and in crisis. Of course, the drive to Tucson is a metaphor for the journey of motherhood. I think that a lot of mothers can relate to the feeling of being surrounded by needy babies and toddlers and still feeling completely alone, lost, and isolated. So this first reading illustrates one of the main themes of Lies of the Magpie, which is the conundrum of how to measure success as a mother. Malia, like everyone, grew up with constant external measures of success test scores, report cards, scholarships. Then she had a baby and there was no measure of if she was doing it right. So this comes from chapter seven. Each day I checked the mailbox for my report card from Kate's delivery, but it never came. Neither were there transcripts informing me if I had successfully passed Spaghetti 101 and could advance to Meatloaf 202. The mailbox did contain several certificates with my husband's name written in gold calligraphy, congratulating him on earning several licenses and showing his official titles. Those certificates got framed and hung on the wall of his new office. My bare walls could only mean that I wasn't succeeding at anything significant. Considering the fact that I hadn't even grown a sufficiently long umbilical cord and caused all sorts of panic and mayhem at the hospital, I figured my grade for Kate's birth couldn't be above a D minus. I really needed to get my act together and start accomplishing something impressive. So with no trophies or awards or a 4.0 GPA in mothering, Malia determines that she must be failing. So she must do bigger and more impressive things to prove she's a successful woman. So she agrees to teach early morning seminary at the same time she starts an at-home business with her husband, continues teaching piano lesson and becomes pregnant with her fourth child. Part two is the struggle. Malia experiences after her fourth baby is born, a bombardment of dark, toxic thoughts the constant chirping magpies of postpartum depression, thus the title lies of the magpie. She declines into feelings of self-loathing and worthlessness. And while the reader sees what's going on, Malia is oblivious to what's happening. She believes that she's just incompetent and that she just needs to get better organized, wake up earlier, study the scriptures harder, pray more diligently, be a better visiting teacher and exercise. She doesn't believe she has postpartum depression because she believes that a hardworking, God-fearing woman doesn't get depression. And if she does, that the best cure is to pull herself up by her bootstraps and plow forward. But that method of pushing through doesn't work and eventually her body shuts down, leading to part three, which is her realization that something has to change. And she begins ardently searching for true healing. Part three is the revelatory journey. At last, Malia opens her heart, listens, and understands several key messages. 
And I'll leave you tonight with um, one of these closing aha moments about mothering from one of the final chapters. One of the rare curiosities of mothering, different from any other occupation, is that you don't have to boast an impressive resume in order to be a good mother. Children don't care if you graduated summa cum laude or had your picture on the front page of a newspaper. My kids don't care what I look like or if my name made any lists. I'm their mom. All they want is me. I used to believe I had given up my chance to be successful when I chose to become a mother. I believe I had literally given up my life for children. The opposite is true. Becoming a mother gave me my real life. Before children, I was a slave to accomplishment, a puppet tied by strings of accolades to a strange marionettist who controlled my every move by offering a false sense of worth with strings attached. The rare buried treasure of mothering is that there are no strings attached. There is no boss, no declaration of personal value in terms of numbers on a paycheck. In this way, becoming a mother is the most liberating feminist thing I've ever done. As a mother, I am the lowliest employee and the CEO. I am my own boss and my own worker bee. I don't work for a paycheck, but I also don't work to build someone else's agenda. I never have to posture for a promotion. As a mother, I am the only company in the world who has truly produced a 100% original product. In fact, every corporation, every endeavor, every operation in the world exists to support me in my work. Without mothers, there is no purpose to the world. Without mothers and children, there's no reason to form governments, build economies, establish trade agreements, report the news, study medicine, or train an army. All these things exist to support my posterity. I am mother. Within me is contained life and the purpose of the earth. I don't mean to sound conceited, but that sounds like a lot of power. Why have I ever felt so small? Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Next, we're going to hear from Anthony Sweet, Repicturing the Restoration, New Art to Expand Our Understanding. So, so now we're going to move into two books uh, in the criticism category. Anthony Sweet is an associate professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. He received his bachelor's degree in painting and drawing, and then a PhD in curriculum and instruction. He's the author of several books, most, most recently Seekers Wanted and The Holy Invitation. And because this is a very uh, visual book um, about art, uh, Anthony prepared a video for us. So I'm going to share that now. Hi there, my name is Anthony Sweat. I am gonna be doing a reading from my book called uh, Repicturing the Restoration, New Art to Expand Our Understanding. I'm gonna be doing a reading on my chapter called The Chamber of Father Whitmer. Since my book is both written and paintings that I did, I'll also be showing some uh, visuals as well for you. Sometime in June 1829, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were wrapping up the translation of the Book of Mormon at the Peter and Mary Whitmer Farm Home in Fayette, New York. A month earlier in May of 1829, back in Harmony, Pennsylvania, they had been visited by the angel John the Baptist and a short time later by the angels Peter, James, and John, who also gave Joseph and Oliver priesthood authority. After Joseph and Oliver were visited by John the Baptist, they went to the Susquehanna River and baptized one another. After Peter, James, and John visited them shortly thereafter, however, there is no record that Joseph Smith or Oliver Cowdery gave each other the gift of the Holy Ghost. When did they take that important step and why? According to Joseph in his history, it has to do with the voice of God speaking to them in the chamber of Peter Whitmer Sr. Joseph records that one day while they were in a bedroom at the Whitmer home, as they continued to translate the Book of Mormon, they, quote, became anxious to have the promise realized to them, which the angel had conferred upon them, that provided they should continue faithful, they also should have the Melchizedek priesthood, which holds the authority for the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, end of quote. 
Although they had been baptized and received keys from Peter, James, and John, according to Joseph, they had yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost. They decided to pray about it, and the prophet said, quote, We have not long been engaged in solemn and fervent prayer when the word of the Lord came to us in the chamber, commanding us that I should ordain Oliver Cowdery to be an elder in the Church of Jesus Christ, and that he should ordain me to the same office, end of quote. Um, did they do it? Sorry. Although they had been confirmed as apostles, they apparently had not been set apart to the office of elder, nor had they been authorized to lay on of hands to confer the Holy Ghost. Did they do it then in the chamber after the Lord spoke to them? No. Joseph's 1838-39 history says, we were commanded to defer this, our ordination, until such times as it should be practicable to have our brethren who had been baptized assemble together when we must have their sanction to our thus proceeding to ordain each, ordain each other and then attend to the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Although largely forgotten today, Joseph Smith considered his sacred experience in the bedroom of Peter Whitmer Sr.'s home an important part of the restoration of Latter-day Saint authority to confer the gift of the Holy Ghost. Joseph mentioned the experience in his official history and in a now canonized letter Doctrine and Covenants 128, verse 21. Just after listing Peter, James, and John in verse 20, Joseph writes of, quote, the voice of God in the chamber of old Father Whitmer, end of quote. Historical narratives are constructed by both official communications and informal conversations. Over time, certain aspects are emphasized and promoted, while others become de-emphasized or forgotten. I created this painting to give a visual representation to help us remember this sacred event that has hitherto been undepicted and often overlooked. So let me show you uh, my painting that I did of the chamber of Father Whitmer. Then I'll read a little analysis of the painting as I conclude. This is a sketch I did, a compositional sketch uh, to get ready for the larger painting. You can see me toying there with the idea of fire, the voice of God coming down. This is the final image uh, that I did. And let me read to you from this chapter describing this image that I painted. As with many of the heavenly images in this series, I stylized and abstracted this event in my visual depiction. Abstraction has its benefits. It allows for the artist to be more interpretive, and the viewer usually embraces those interpretations better because it isn't depicted in a hyper-realistic painting that is often confused with historical reality. Abstracting this image works well because historians, theologians, scholars, and ecclesiastical church leaders disagree about the meaning of what happened in the chamber of Father Whitmer, or they simply don't know. I felt a stylized, abstracted painting best fit this somewhat nebulous church history event. Looking at the painting, one notices the large, oversized head of God at the top of the composition, I made him proportionately huge to speak to his greatness and grandeur in comparison to the, to the smaller, weaker mortals like us. One aspect of his history that is unclear is what is meant by the voice of the Lord. Does this mean that this was a revelatory experience, a visionary one, or a physical visitation in the room? I don't know. Joseph also speaks of the voice of Peter, James, and John just before he mentions the voice of God in the chamber of Father Whitmer. We know that Peter, James, and John physically visited Joseph Smith. Was this experience with God in the chamber the same? Perhaps, but maybe not. Thus, a strong black line delineates uh, the head of God in the blue symbolizing heaven with the paneled green walls of the bedroom. I chose to depict the voice as a flowing yellow shape coming down out of heaven. It enters a swirling motion. It creates a swirling motion as it enters the hearts of both Joseph and Oliver. They kneel, eyes closed in the act of prayer. Oliver's clasped hands and Joseph's hand on his heart suggest their earnest and heartfelt desire to obtain the gift of the Holy Ghost. In my image, I hope you connect with the idea of God speaking through the veil, his voice coming down like fire representing the Holy Ghost, and uh, representing the Holy Ghost leading to Joseph and Oliver's prayerful hands with the compositional lines leading the viewer upward to heaven and outward toward others. And that is my reading from part of my chapter on the Chamber of Father Whitmer. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anthony. Next, we're going to hear from Michael Hicks um, about his, from his book, Spencer Kimball's Record Collection, Essays on Mormon Music. 
Michael has recently retired as professor of music at BYU, a composer, poet, and author. He's the former editor of the journal American Music, author of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir Biography. He has won three previous AML awards for Mormonism and Music, a History, uh, the Street Legal Version of Mormon's Book, a special award in adaption in 2012, which I just I just got that book recently. I've been reading it. I'm very much enjoying a very uh, interesting uh, retelling of the Book of Mormon. And I, I just, I've really fallen in love with it. And The Second Coming of Mormon Music, uh, a article he wrote for the Center for Latter-day Saints Arts, a presentation he did there in 2017. And I just recorded a dialogue uh, interview with Michael and Jake Johnson, another great uh, music scholar in, in our tradition. And hopefully we'll get that edited and get that uh, out there to everybody soon. So Michael, go ahead. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, thanks to uh, AML for the nomination and all your great work and, and the privilege of being uh, with the rest of you tonight. Um, I'm just gonna read five minutes of the preface to this book, which explains a little bit what it's about because it, the title is a little bit odd. Um, so, I wrote the title essay as a stretched out journal entry for a journal that doesn't exist. I kept journals for decades, off and on, bound books brimming with confessions, self-analysis, travelogues, movie reviews, weather reports, all the typical journal fare of an ex-hippie who often regrets the ex. Now shoved to the back of a closet, those journals are freighted with mood swings and doctrinal noodling, but light on social events, which I shunned, and relationships, which mostly amounted to footnotes to Dickinson's line, the soul selects its own society, then shuts the door. But the events that triggered my title, that is being handed a prophet's vinyl plates, as if I were some shaggy headed suburban Moroni, escaped my now defunct journal keeping. Yet those events midwifed onto the planet the name of this book, a hand-picked anthology of shorter pieces I've written on music in Mormondom. I picked a few old essays, rewrote some, wrote new ones, then arranged them into something like a row of stained glass windows, each self-contained, but all told, making an odd narrative of tableaus. They fall into three sections. The first roams through the 19th century's popular songs, hymns, and musical theater. The second wanders into the 20th century with the stories behind two record albums, followed by some lifting of the curtain of Mormon hymn book making near the century's end. The third collects ad hoc slices of criticism and memoir from Broadway to Spencer Kimball's shelves to in the end, a lip chewing account of the making of the two other books in my Mormon music trilogy. You see, I do consider this book the third in a set that began in 1989 with the publication of Mormonism and Music, a History, and continued in 2015 with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, a biography. To create this new one, I didn't just brush the leftovers of the other books into a pail and call it good. Selecting the stories to include, exclude, or write from scratch for this one proved no small task, uh, yet one far head scratchier and juicier than whatever doggedness shaped the other books. Most of these essays still have the academic ring to them, however breezy and streamlined the prose might try to be, but I'd like to think they offer a nice journey from let's say the front door to the back. I grew up hearing Jesus line in my father's house are many mansions. I hope this book can be like that. One house, but each room bigger in some way than it looks from the outside. Because in each, we get to linger, try out the furniture, stoke a fire, have a drink, and well, turn on some music. 
better than a journal, I'd say. Uh, the line between Renaissance man and clever dilettante is a hair's breadth. I've been introduced many times as the former, but I'm much more the latter. Mostly, I think of myself as a plate spinner. You know the routine, spinning plates on top of wooden dowels, one after another, reaching up as needed to keep them all rotating and balanced. It's a circus act. I first saw on Ed Sullivan's show and last saw on YouTube. That's been my whole career, awkwardly but insistently reaching up to keep all these plates of different sizes and weights spinning, writing poetry, singing political folk songs, playing loungy piano, penning comic ditties, composing avant-garde chamber music, sketching portraits and cartoons, analyzing offbeat music for academic journals, and oh yeah, writing books on music history from 1960s rock to legit experimental composers to, as you see, music among the Mormons. My favorite literary character as a child was Curious George. He unwittingly became my mentor, one reckless curiosity to the next. And I'll leave it there. Hope that whets your appetite for more. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And so, as Theric said in the comments, it's such a great title. Between that and this is the plate, this, this is the plate. We've had some really great titles this year. <laughs> uh, our final speaker is going to be our final reader is going to be William L. Davis uh, from his book Visions in a Seer Stone: Joseph Smith and the Making of the Book of Mormon. William is an independent scholar, holds a PhD in theater and performance from UCLA, and has published in Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, John Bunyan Studies, a Leviathan, a Journal of Melville Studies, and many others. And Bill is here, but he also said he sent me a video, so we'll show that first, and then if he wants to say anything, he can. So I will start. Hi, I'm William Davis, author of Visions in a Seer Stone, Joseph Smith and the Making of the Book of Mormon. I'm grateful to be part of the annual conference of the Association of Mormon Letters, and I appreciate the invitation to come and read from my book and participate in this year's proceedings. About my book, one of the central premises of my research is that the Book of Mormon is the result of an extended oral performance rather than being a written literary project. In other words, Joseph Smith spoke the text into existence rather than writing it down and composing it in a way that's familiar to modern literary authorship or translation projects. This process of oral delivery also made use of common techniques from Joseph's uh, contemporary sermon culture. And most prominently, evangelical preachers often created brief outlines of their stories and sermons which they used as guides to deliver their sermons and speeches. But they didn't prepare the actual words in advance. Instead, they improvised the words in the moment of performance. The text of the Book of Mormon contains substantial evidence that Joseph Smith approached the oral composition of the Book of Mormon in this same manner. The following excerpt from the book comes from the final chapter, when I'm proposing a theory of Joseph Smith's translation project process, starting on page 190. When combined together, the textual evidence and historical accounts favor a scenario in which Smith began thinking about the Book of Mormon narratives sometime before September 22nd, 1823, when he first announced the appearance of the angel Moroni and the existence of an ancient record. In the years that followed, Smith carefully developed his ideas about the narratives through a process of revelatory translation, which may or may not have involved the use of the seer stone. Through a meticulous process of testing out narrative patterns against his affective spiritual responses, Smith produced revised and honed the narratives over several years, becoming intimately familiar with the stories and characters during the process. 
By the time he actually started dictating the text, Smith would have required only a small handful of notes containing brief outlines and narrative cues, which he could keep private in his personal papers. Such preparations would have provided him with a guiding framework of story patterns, which he could then expand rapidly and extemporaneously in the moment of oral performance, allowing himself the flexibility to improvise new topics and tangents along the way. Alternatively, depending on his level of increasing familiarity with the overall narrative, he may not have required any notes at all, relying exclusively on his memory of the historical structures he had formulated and his semi-extemporaneous expansion of them. In the end, However one chooses to understand Smith's involvement in the production of the Book of Mormon, his method of revelatory translation complicates easy characterizations of the process. Because Smith's overall approach involved meditating on narrative possibilities while seeking spiritual confirmation about their truthfulness and historical authenticity, the work emerged from some form of dialectical process which, nuanced according to one's beliefs, might be understood as involving the participation of the Holy Spirit in connection with Smith's inspired imagination, or as a complex matrix of Smith's affective and spontaneous responses to conscious narrative creations and subconscious elaborations in his mind. Whatever we may choose to believe, the historical record strongly suggests that Joseph Smith genuinely felt that his project emerged from divine inspiration and guidance. Thanks for listening. And as a last note in favor for all of the authors who have had a chance to participate in this conference, I hope that the audience members will show their support by going out and purchasing their books. Thank you so much. Thank you, William. William, did you want to say anything live? Oh, I just appreciate having the chance to come and participate with everyone and um, listening to everyone read from their books. And, and I've been going through and reading all the books as well. And so hearing the author's voices, in addition to reading the text and my own imagined voice that comes with that has been really fascinating. This has been a lot of fun. Great. Thank you very much. I also want to give my appreciation to everyone who's here today. It was wonderful readings, and it's great to see this wide variety of nonfiction, you know, from very academic works to very personal works, and then a lot of works that kind of mix the two, you know, both both serious, you know, scripture study and kind of personal reflection, and from all these different artistic uh, angles. I really enjoy seeing this this wide variety, and also the people who weren't able to come here today. Levina Fielding Anderson has a wonderful collection. She's one of the founders of the Association for Mormon Letters. Uh, and we have two great uh, new collections of 19, or late 19th and early 20th century literature that's been lost for a long time. And this is a great opportunity to rediscover those as well. All right, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll, we'll, we'll see everybody.